And we are back. We are the Coalition, loud and proud, outrage porn free, civilly disobedient media broadcasting live on the worldwide Coalition Media Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center, deep in the heart of the very challenged but the very city we love so much, Providence, Rhode Island. Facebook.com slash the Coalition Radio on the mighty, mighty Twitter at Coalition underscore radio, and of course the mothership at Coalition Radio.us. Whether you're listening live tonight or you hear this in podcast form in the coming days, you can take a moment and like or follow us at all the above, including, we'll list at the end of this sequence, the social media links for the Goldwater Institute. Well, we, we, we alluded to this last week when Tarnell Brown, who is really one of the philosopher kings of the libertarian movement, came on. There are a handful of people that, well, when we are in distress, we put a beacon to the sky. In this case, that beacon is usually wearing a bow tie. And when we, we call for his help and his divine intercession in a situation that, while I'm smiling now, quite frankly, is heartbreaking. This show has long advocated for private free market alternatives for public education. To provide, and the primary reason is to, it's not philosophical, to provide students of all types, of all backgrounds, with the educational opportunities that will allow them to compete in a free market. Because as always, we believe here in the coalition that the capitalism is the mechanism by, with which the individual can really realize their full human potential. And the report that was released this week, which served to not only buttress to blow up the RICAS testing results, and of course, if you're not from the area, that was a clone of the Massachusetts standardized testing that took place, shows that Rhode Island, and I'm well beyond the rhetoric, I'm well beyond the hype, well beyond the diatribes, but Rhode Island may arguably have the worst school systems in America. To the point where individuals in, from Johns Hopkins, an independent, highly rated university, one of the great universities in America, where individuals, professional educators, who well-traveled, well-seasoned, were actually moved to tears when seeing the conditions, the curriculum, the overall educational quality of the city of Providence of Rhode Island school system. It is beyond appalling. In fact, it's disgusting. A few months ago, I happened to appear on the Lively Experiment, a, a local show, or kind of the official talking head show uh, for the state of Rhode Island. It's broadcast locally on, on public, Rhode Island public television. And um, I alluded to the term educational holocaust, and I, I got a little bit of grief from that, and I stand by it. That was before this report was released. Not only do I stand by it, I'm not quite sure if those words are strong enough. So we put the beacon to the sky, and we asked Jonathan Butcher. He, of course, is a senior fellow at the Goldwater Institute. If I can read directly from the official bio because it sums up, again, a Renaissance man. He has researched and testified on educational policy and school choice programs around the United States. His work has appeared in journals such as Education Next and the Georgetown Journal of Law and Public Policy. He's appeared on local and national TV outlets, C-SPAN, Fox News, Radio programs, too numerous to, to, to stipulate to. The Wall Street Journal, Educational Week, National Review. A fundamental member of the early days, not that long ago, but the early days of what is really a new wave of educational reform. He's been here in the past to discuss some of the really, really interesting financing techniques, scholarship techniques, saving techniques that are being employed in Arizona as a function, if you will, of the Goldwater's, I think, revolutionary work in taking model legislation, putting into place, in a sense, retrofitting it like it's a widget machine into it within a state constitution, and then watching people prosper as a result. So I am immensely proud that he's willing to join us from time to time here on the coalition. Jonathan, thank you for answering the call, the light in the sky. <laughs> And please, for the love of God, help us. What, you know, you, you mentioned in the run-up to the show that you'd uh, taken a little bit of time to, to review the situation. What in the name of God do we do? Well, thank you for having me on. And uh, the, the report is really nothing short of scathing. Um, and I think a couple of things stand out from what the researchers at Hopkins found with Providence Schools. Uh, one of the things that they found is that parents feel helpless. Uh, one of the um, and so to, to back up for just a moment. So this report interviewed a sample of teachers, principal, school leaders, and parents in the Providence school system. Uh, they said in in their report that they 
sampled enough and interviewed enough so that it was um, uh, above the level of statistical significance. So we can have, I think, some um, uh, some confidence that the re results that they found or that the comments that they received are are trust or that we can trust them, right? That it's that that it's reliable in terms of the general sentiment of those involved with the Providence school system. So, so I think, um, you know, based on, on the, the due diligence, I think, in this report, I think you have something that does give um, uh, a, snap, a good snapshot of what's happening. Okay, so with that out of the way, uh, they, they found a couple of things that, that caught my eye. So the first is that they found that parents say that they feel helpless uh, oftentimes, that they do not feel like they have a way to intervene in their child's learning experience. And what's interesting about that is in states that have uh, private school choice programs or even robust public school options, such as charter schools, places like Arizona, Florida, uh, even Ohio, uh, states that have strong charter schools, Colorado, mm -hmm. um, when you ask parents involved in those systems how they feel about their child's learning experience, the responses are much different, right? Parents that are that are involved in deciding how and where their ch their children learn, they uh, often report very high levels of satisfaction. Uh, that's a pretty common finding, in fact, mm -hmm. um, and and so much so that that the the results of parent surveys from these private school either private scholarship programs or education savings accounts, uh, such as in Arizona and Florida. Um, we, we can say, you know, that, that, that families feel like they are able to adjust when their children need something different. So, so that was the first thing. I would say the second, and um, also something that's very relevant today, is that the teachers do not feel uh, safe in, this, in school. Uh, teachers were reporting um, that uh, they um, the the policy is to reduce suspensions and expulsions, which really kind of made my uh, made my my ears perk up because this is something that received a lot of attention last year um, with the shooting in uh, in Florida uh, in Parkland uh, at Stoneman Douglas High School, and that is because there in the Broward County school system they had developed a policy of reducing suspensions and expulsions. And it was something that Washington then turned into a federal dear colleague letter, which is a fancy way of saying the Obama administration in 2014, the Justice Department and the Department of Education sent a letter to schools around the country suggesting that schools try to reduce suspensions and expulsions. And uh, we have found uh, at the, and my, my colleagues and other researchers at the Manhattan Institute have found that teachers in large districts, such as Los Angeles, Oklahoma City, uh, Washington State, for example, they report not feeling safe. They report that school morale goes down when these types of policies are put into place. So I think what you know we're, we're hearing from this report is that once again, if you take away the ability of teachers to try to maintain order in their classroom, you put them at a significant disadvantage. So if I was to name the top two, those, those would be two of the things that really caught my attention. Now, anecdotally, because one of the challenges in, if you're a civilian in following education is that so much of it, and, and I always uh, use the analogy with Harry Potter, um, you know, the dark arts, the dark sciences, education is often referred to in that in such a way that I think is intentionally condescending towards parents who are not educational pro professionals. They, there's an air of mystery and intrigue surrounding the terminology. Lots of, lots of shorthand, lots of buzzwords, lots of industry speak, you know, and somehow parents very often, in a, in a way I believe intentionally, to reduce the number of IEPs and interventions that you make parents intimidated. The so many schools anecdotally report that fe federal funding and or often state funding is tied into lowering the number of suspensions. Now, is that urban legend or is, do you see that in practice around the country? Well, what happened after the Dear Colleague letter that we're uh, just referring to in 2014 is that schools that did not reduce suspensions and expulsions of minority students 
if the Office of Civil Rights, which said that they would conduct investigations into districts all over the country, um, if they found that the percentage of minority students who were expen- who were suspended or expelled, so shorthand for that would be exclusionary discipline. So um, if the Office of Civil Rights found that, yes, it would be very possible that the federal government would choose to withhold federal funding. That, that didn't happen to my knowledge. What typically happens is the Washington will threaten something like that. Uh-huh. It will make the papers. It will cause public embarrassment for the school officials who will then immediately try to adjust the statistics that they're keeping right. for uh, how, how they manage how they manage the classrooms. And what you know the, the negative outcomes or the negative consequences of that is that the classrooms do become less safe and, and students who should not be uh, in the classroom wind up staying there. And that makes it difficult for the students you know, who are there and, and are legitimately trying to, trying to learn. It's interesting. Rhode Island is, well, Providence is the extreme. There are at least four other school districts that are in some type of terminal dead spin here. And, and one of them is a little, little town called Bristol Warren. Bristol and Warren Bristol being the oldest 4th of July parade in America, 200 plus years, was observed yesterday. It's a bucolic seaside setting, and yet one of the middle schools had to be shut down this year because of a teacher sick out pointing towards. Now, this is an overwhelmingly white middle class community because of teachers feeling unsafe, and it became, at least, again, this is all anecdotal because it's so difficult to get real statistics out in real time, uh, there were, I guess, in one of the schools involved, there were absolutely no reports of bullying in a major middle school. Now, I'm not saying that this place is a minefield of bullying, but it's also hard to imagine that there were none. It's kind of like that election ward in Philadelphia where there were no votes for George W. Bush (laughs) or Mitt Romney or ever. and, And so, again, to your point, there's this constant massaging, if you will, of the statistics, what's reported, what's not reported, in order to maintain at least the veneer of control until one day you realize there's none. Uh, it's, it's, what do we, it's so, so, so what, I mean, are there models of success because of parental intervention, intervention excuse me, in school districts in America? I mean, what, in the case of this Bristol Warren, a public outcry led to the resignation of the superintendent because there was a whole number of allegations of educational malpractice and some malfeasance, but that's hard to do. What, what tools do parents have now in the year 2019 to take their education back for their children? Yeah, that's a great question. It, there is some reason uh, to be hopeful and to be optimistic about what is happening um, in, in a couple of key places. So first, I would say, um, you know, like, like we were talking about, there, there has been polling done since the incident at Parkland last year, as well as what happened in Santa Fe, Texas. And it is very much on the minds of parents. Surveys show that parents and students are feel fearful for their safety. So this is something that parents and students are, are thinking about and talking about all the time. Now, what happened last year, and this is a credit to Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, is that she took? She was uh, tasked by the president to head a commission that would look at school discipline practices and school safety practices around the country, and they would put together a report at the end of the year, and they were charged with considering the repeal or the rescission, technically is what it is, of the Dear Colleague letter from the Obama administration. So I'll skip to the end, and after a year of review, Secretary DeVos did call for that letter to be rescinded, and it was rescinded, rescinded at the end of last year. So it, there is no longer the federal sort of um, imprimatur, I guess, or uh, the federal uh, um, uh, support for the idea that uh, they should, that schools should reduce suspensions and expulsions. Uh, so so that, that's good for schools for a couple of reasons, not the least of which is that it puts the control back in the hands of teachers to keep their classrooms safe. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, it is a decision district by district, and so I, I think this is where um, a solution that I think you and I have talked about before and many in the, um, uh, in the world of, um, 
uh, of um, conservative uh, of thought and, and frankly of liberty minded individuals will, will know where we're headed with this. But in places where parents can choose how and where their children learn, whether it's a private school scholarship or school voucher or education savings account, those programs have actually been uh, correlated with safer schools. So there has been studies that there have been studies that have been performed that have shown that in areas where their parents do have choices, parents report that they are happier with the level of safety in their child's school in no less than Washington, D.C., for example. There was a report that came out just in the past few years about that. So um, I think as we give parents the ability to choose uh, where their child goes to school or how their child learns, uh, they report being happier with the degree of safety in those schools. So I, I think that, that this should give people hope, right, because now school choice is, is uh, become something that uh, is more talked about today because uh, Secretary DeVos has kind of elevated the status of this issue, uh -huh. uh, coming from a background of uh, working in the private school choice world for many years. So um, I, I think people uh, really should look beyond the headlines. I think that some of the, the major media sometimes uh, write about what's going on with private school choice or what it may mean and actually look into what parents are saying, the parents that are actually have children in these programs. You know, it, it's it's what's what's both fascinating and alarming to me at the same time is this the emergence, if you will. And again, so many of us who are parents who are not experts, who are, who are not policy steeped in policy, see this as a recent development. Is the emergence of these pretty arcane? Uh, I mean, uh, Facebook would have a field day with the algorithms that they're using in what they call school funding. Now. Both of my children, as I like to point out, as, as a, you know, in, in a sense, by accident and by fortune, I have two daughters, one's 24, one's 22. The 22-year-old just graduated college two weeks ago. Neither of my children ever spent a day in their entire lives in public education, ever, N not even pretend. And they've both done very, very well, and that's a testament to their mom and, and to their work ethic. But to me, it's also proof positive of what, what can happen. Fascinatingly enough, if, if you're someone like me who struggled mightily to put his daughters through private education, and I mean struggled, I mean I am, I am that guy who somehow, you know, we're still paying the bills, but I am that guy. And, you know, the middle class guy who somehow literally by hook and crook made it work. I have now been criticized, because I'm public about it now that my children are out of school, I don't usually involve them in this stuff, but but I have been criticized for, are you ready for this, for abandoning our public schools. Despite the fact that my tax load is no less than anyone else, because of these school formulas, somehow, because the money ultimately follows the child, somehow, people like me who abandoned, did I mention the word abandoned? Not, hey, I saved you $15,000 a year times 12, all right? Not, hey, thanks for... for for freeing up some resources for kids who are, you know, might have learning different ways of learning, or hey Pat, we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll spend a couple hundred dollars years on books for you to make it a little easier for you to not spend taxpayer money. I am I have abandoned the public school system. I found bitter irony in that, as you can tell. Is that something you've run into across the nation with, with these school funding issues, uh, these crazy algorithms? Well, congratulations on the graduation, your daughter's graduation. That's great news. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I mean, I, I think we have to remember that the schools were created to uh, help students. It was, it's not, uh, not something that we should feel like every child must attend a public school because mm -hmm. that's not fair to the students that may have unique needs, for example, besides the fact that parents should be the ones who are in the driver's seat about deciding what is best for their child. They shouldn't be told mm -hmm. what they have to do, and their options shouldn't be limited to simply the school that's in their zip code. Um, the, the way that we uh, need to be looking at learning in the 21st century is understanding that uh, every child needs something different, every child is different, and we do have a variety of ways that we can provide uh, learning experiences for students. I mean, they can, you know, these days you can take classes online, you can find a, you know, a tutor via Skype who's, who's in another country, you can, you know, study for the SAT um, you, you know, using a computer program, you can attend, um, you know, a school virtual state. I mean, all of these options are available today, and we need to make sure that 
uh, that parents have the ability to make these choices. Remember, because the purpose of, of education should be to give people the opportunity for human flourishing, right? That, that should be the idea here. That's what we're what we should be after. When the public school system was created all of those, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, I think generally the idea was assimilation, right? We had a lot of uh, uh, families moving here from other countries and, and they wanted to create a system that would help um, people understand what it, what it meant to, to be American. Well, things have changed today, right? Education today is looked at something that should propel people and improve their, um, their opportunities, right? To, to give them the chance to create a better future for themselves. And so um, if that is is the purpose, which it, sh- it should be, right? It should be something that allows people to improve where they are. Well, then we should give people options to choose something that is successful. They should not be forced to attend a school, as in the report that, that we were talking about earlier, um, in a system that appears to really be struggling to, um, to provide a quality uh, learning experience. Yeah, um, I- we, we're... I mentioned, you know, the, some of the findings from that report. Another one that really caught my eye is they were very critical. Well, they reported that teachers and school administrators were very critical of the collective bargaining agreement with, um, uh, that, that they had with the union. Uh-huh. And that is also something that, that people really need to be aware of, um, that the union has a significant control and, is, and the people who are working in the system do not feel that it is helping them do their jobs better. You know, you have a situation, in my, in my daughter's case, I'll use this as a, uh, I, like I said, for years I've stayed away from discussing them, but one is very, very striking, and I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. French is no longer occupies the role it has for many, many years in American high schools. For French and Spanish and German were always the languages, really, that were taught, if you're of a certain age, my age. You're younger, so it might have been different for you. Um, French has really fallen on hard times, has nothing to do with the French, but just it's, it's not seen as a primary language anymore. The independent school that my daughter attended had a number of very talented young women who were French teachers. They were also from Syria. So the idea, I guess, anecdotally it seems, bubbled up one day, well, we don't have enough enrollment for the French teachers. These are certified, highly skilled teachers. What can we do? They started an Arabic program. My daughter had four years of high school Arabic. It was a strong enough program so that she placed out of first semester Arabic at an Ivy League university. That's the way it's supposed to work. Needs are assessed. Ideas are proffered. Decisions are made. And we move forward to find new and better ways to deliver that education to our children. Because as I argued in my run-up, all kids are great kids until the point where they've been either raised by wolves or thrown into situations like in a school like the, you've read about in Providence where they can no longer be children and they lose the abilities or the opportunities to continue being great kids. You know? and, and, and so when I see something as simple as that, and, and by the way, that school, that, that small independent school, uh, has now, in, in the space of 10 years or so, about a half a dozen young women have majored at significant institutions, Ivy League and near Ivy League super schools in Islamic and Middle Eastern economics, aided by their jump up, if you will, in their fluency in Arabic. And they are all out in the world now, literally engaging in everything from Islamic women's rights to, in my daughter's case, Islamic literature and cross-cultural uh, exchanges of literature to, in some cases, boots on the ground in a variety of... And, and, and that's not to obsess over that one issue, but it's emblematic of the larger challenges of education. We are international now. We need to prepare children to compete internationally. That's seen as a cliche, but you know from your experiences that the finest schools on the planet now largely are secondary schools, colleges are still in America, largely, not always, but they are international in their clientele. And how are these children, after reading that study, going to compete at any level? And it's not their fault. We did yeah, that. I mean, that, that was the, the, one of the, the headline finding, uh, and we haven't even brought it up yet, is that they, the, the, the study f- uh, said that the level of um, academic achievement or the level of um, uh, the delivery of learning 
was very, very poor. Right. And, you know, that, that, was, that was the headline. And uh, all of the other things which are just as concerning about discipline and, and, and parents feeling powerless and all of those things are, are uh, certainly a part, are, are important. But, but the idea that, that learning is not happening is, I mean, that, that should be, um, you know, the first thing that jumps out. So I think what's happening, um, so in my work as a senior policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation, um, as well as uh, with, with Goldwater, um, the, the research that we have done on um, looking at what states are, are trying to do to um, give parents quality options uh, include things like education savings accounts. Uh, Arizona has now had these for uh, going on, it'll be eight years. Uh, Florida has had them for five years. Um, and, and more and more, uh, we hear stories of families who felt that they were hopeless or that they had run out of options. And then they applied for these uh, flexible learning accounts. And what happens is, is with an education savings account, the state deposits a portion of a child's funds from the school funding formula in a private account that parents can then use to buy educational products and services for their children. Think of it like um, a health savings account, for example, right. where you can go and, and buy a variety of services. With an education savings account, you can pay private school tuition, you can buy online classes, you can save money from year to year, you buy books, you can hire a tutor, um, you can pay for educational therapy. So all of these great options are now available to um, thousands of families across these states, as well as Mississippi, Tennessee, North Carolina. So this, this is a whole new approach. This is a whole new way to think about uh, how students can learn in the 21st century, how to make the most of the options that we have available to us today. Right. And I just think, I think after a report that, that is really as, um, just as damning as, as, as was done um, by the folks at Hopkins um, about Providence schools, I really, I think that, that families need to be made aware of what options are out there. And, uh, and I think it's incumbent on lawmakers uh -huh. to, um, to look at what other states are doing and, and really to not be satisfied with the contracts that the schools are, are being, um, uh, the teachers are, are signing with the unions. Um, this is something that, that really, it, it, should, it should appall uh, families to know that, that educators feel powerless because of uh, the arrangement that they've made with a, with a special interest group. Right, and, and so on a practical level, let's, let's, if you don't mind, indulge me here. Arizona is, is a state with... I mean, you talk about just not only challenging and beautiful geography, but you've got this astonishing array of communities. You know, and again, I'm an outsider. I visit it occasionally, so I'll, I'm being very generic here. But you think of Scottsdale as a, a wealthy, upscale community. You think of Tucson or Phoenix as being very complicated cities with wealth and at the same time some extreme poverty. And so a That's very diverse. Right. right. So mm -hmm. a city like Tucson or Phoenix, uh, for that matter, I think really is a perfect analogy for a city like Providence. Uh, maybe even more challenged because of the immediacy of, of certain border issues. We have a, a very a, a large po immigrant population here, but the needs are so much more exigent in a state like Arizona. So you're a parent. Your child goes to the Phoenix Public Schools. Um, they attend a standard fourth year in a fourth grade, say, and, and the school is paying a certain amount of money for fourth grade. What happens then? How does that money literally translate either away from the fourth grade education, or are we talking about incremental funds that are made available for dyslexic issues, um, or a, a child who is, uh, you know, an advanced scholar, maybe language? How does that, how does it physically work? Sure. Well, as soon as you start talking about school funding formulas, people's eyes begin to glaze over almost immediately. Right. right. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to make the topic um, uh, compelling, except to say that um, I, I wrote an article some years ago and, and said that most school um, funding formulas are written more like a riddle than they are a set of numbers or a, a set of budget line right. items. So we'll, we'll say this. Typically, around the country, uh, the federal government supplies a little less than 10% of the total amount of money that goes to it per student. The local district and the state then split the remainder at about 45% each. Now, that's pretty big gen you know, generalization there. It's going to be different from district to district. Some wealthier districts, you mentioned Scottsdale, 
uh, they uh, and, and other their other wealthier districts in Arizona, for example, where the local amount actually covers just about everything. Uh, so you have just the local funds as well as the federal funds. But take just, just to take an average, right? You have a small portion coming from Washington, a little less than 10 percent. And then the remainder is split between the state and the locality in property taxes. Okay, so here's where it tends to get interesting. With an education savings account, the federal portion is no longer used. So there's no federal money that's in an education savings account. The local money is also no longer used. So that money, at least for a period of time, is retained in a school district's budget. It, it may be short. It may not be very long, but, but it's usually about a year. Um, and then what is left is the state portion. So the state portion then is taken out of the normal funding stream and is put into this unique account that parents have access to. So the good news for a school is that their budgets are not updated day to day. You know, their budgets or their, their spending or their, the, where their money is coming from, it's usually only updated at the end of the year or sometimes Sometimes somewhere uh, around October is when the student, first student count is taken, and then usually in April it's updated, and the budget numbers are usually updated then at the end of the year. So if a child chooses to leave to use an education savings account, the money is not going to disappear immediately. The school will still have access to those resources for a period of time. But what's more important is that the family then has access to their taxpayer resources to help their child learn. And so the money that's then put in their account, it's different in some of the different states. So Arizona, Florida, and North Carolina, actually, they each do it very differently. In Arizona, parents get a prepaid spending card that they can take to a school and swipe a card reader. Or there's a, some great videos online of children who use education savings accounts, and they go to an educational therapist. And the educational therapist actually has one of those little squares that they put on top of their phone and the parent pays for it right there, swipes it you know, right there on the, the phone and, and pays for the service. In Florida, it's a little different. Parents will go online and tell the, um, it's a scholarship organization that helps to run the program there. And they tell the scholarship organization what they would like to purchase. And then uh, usually parents will spend their own money and then get reimbursed from their child's account. Uh -huh. The future, and what's really exciting is what's happening in North Carolina. And I think that this should really get parents excited because in North Carolina, they have contracted with a private company that specializes in paying for educational services. And they create um, an online system that has a certain number of vendors on it who are approved by the state. And parents go online and make purchases and using their child's account all online. Money never has to change hands. It helps to reduce the, the level of intentional or unintentional misuse of a child's account funds. Uh, it's really the future, I think, of, of spending. Uh, it's very much like the way that we take an Uber or a Lyft today using our smartphone. Um, so that's happening right now as we speak. It's happening <coughs> in North Carolina. Um, very much a, um, a, a, a current way to, uh, to, to pay for services. Uh, so it's very exciting. So now, take for example, uh, again, Charlotte is a city that comes to mind, which is facing, again, it's, it's a big city, lots of multicultural issues, lots of language issues, all the, all the typical big city stuff that you get. Wonderful place, wonderful people. So is a child in North Carolina able to then simultaneously retain their participation as a Charlotte fourth grader while simultaneously having this amount of funds set aside for, well, everything from therapy to music lessons. Is it, is, it, is it that simple? Right. So good question. So parents remove their child from the assigned school and they use an education savings account separately from attendance at their assigned school. Now they can buy public school services so they can pay for extracurricular activities. They can pay for uh, even public school classes if they choose, uh, but they cannot be both full-time students at their assigned school, uh, as well as use an account. But you know that's um, you know that's an important detail. But but really, for the families that are using these accounts, especially the families of children with special needs, oftentimes they've tried everything that they knew how right. in the public school system. Right? They've tried to talk to the teachers. They've tried special classes. Usually, uh, in in the dozens and dozens of, of, of savings account parents that I've talked to, 
um, who have children with special needs, usually they have tried everything they could to make it work in the local school. And they have just said, you know what, I'm, uh, I need something different. And that's why they took the steps to use an account. Mm -hmm. So in this case, a child could potentially att attend a private, and, and, and there's, there's, and I'm going to lead on with the potential after effect economically. A child could attend a school dedicated to, for example, we focus on dyslexia on the show a lot because it's a, such a challenging issue in public schools generally in Rhode Island even before these reports came out, were generally concluded to do a very poor job of intervention early enough in the life of a young dyslexic child to have a significant impact. It's one of those, as they say, the educators say, you first learn to read and then you read to learn. If you don't, as a dyslexic, learn to process reading differently, then often the time, time it's third, fourth, fifth grade, it's not too late, but you're at a significant disadvantage. So a student could attend a school like that, use educational savings accounts towards that, and then reduce the overall, ironically, reducing the overall cost to the school district. But to me, the beauty of this system, and, and maybe I'm just overly Pollyannish, I'm trying to find that bright light. And in in what you'll agree after reading is, a, I mean, we haven't even talked on the physical plant issues surrounding these schools. Those were beyond startling. But folks are saying, well, okay, well, where are these schools? Where there exists an opportunity to make a profit and to compete in the free market, it is irrelevant whether that area of product is food, machinery, or education. We have in this nation highly skilled people who are looking for a revenue stream so that they can provide a competitive alternative to public education. You know, right now, in most of the country, that simply does not exist. The parent has to come up with the money themselves, all right? But if, if in fact, they're able to, you know, create demand, the market will respond, won't it? Well, sure. And, and ultimately, the goal of these programs is to give every child the chance at a great experience. We want every child to succeed and have a chance at the American dream. And so in Arizona, we have seen that schools have expanded their enrollment and uh, have uh, added to their services as education saving, as more students have used education savings accounts. Um, I think the charter school world is also a great example of this. I think when charter school laws become available in states, uh, the schools will open up. Um, and they, these are, are public schools that are created by, by uh, teachers uh, and parents and community leaders offer another public option for, for families. And Rhode Island families would be, would be familiar with these. Um, but in much the same way, I think, when families and community leaders see that there's a need and they're given the opportunity to create something, they, they will do so. They will do so. Absolutely. Um, and, yeah. and, and that's, you know, the, the whole idea here is, is every child should have the chance to succeed. That's what education should be. It should be about opportunity. Now, I know you only got a couple of minutes left, so there's one area you alluded to that I want to touch on. Last week, we had Colin Sharkey on. He's the executive director of the Association of American Educators. And he is spearheading an effort based on some independent studies they've done at understanding the impact of Janus, and particularly on the teaching profession. What came out of his their studies was how startlingly small the, uh, the level of teacher education is with respect to their union rights. So they have made it their mission to go out and, you know, and I'm a helpful guy too, so I like to help. Um, <laughs> so we have kind of made it our mission here to, uh, and I know Freedom of Prosperity is, is all over this, and they're doing a great job, of educating teachers as to what their union rights are. It's not necessarily union bashing. It's simply making people aware of where their responsibilities and rights begin and end with regard to union participation. How important is it a year post Janus that we get p teachers on the path of understanding their role not only in belonging to a union but impacting the, the type of collective bargaining that has been an obstacle to so many school systems in the past? Is, is, am I overstating that? No, this is absolutely vital, especially after this report uh, that we've been talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. um, when, when, they, when teachers and school leaders are reporting that the collective bargaining agreement excuse me, impedes their ability to serve children or to be successful uh, at their schools. I mean, this, there, there is no excuse for that. Um, these, these special interest groups should not be inhibiting 
educators' ability to serve children. Um, and, you know, teachers unions should not be proud of this. They should not be proud to hear this. And, um, you know, uh, a quick aside here, these are the same interest groups that file lawsuits every time a private school choice option is made available in a state. They have tried to sue to shut down and take away education savings accounts from children with special needs in both Arizona and Florida, as well as in uh, Nevada, where the, the they had a law for many years. So uh, this is something law- lawmakers um, need to be aware of, um, of, of, frankly, um, a, a damaging aspect of, of the whole landscape in, in Providence. Um, so yes, teachers should be made aware of, um, of what their options are. And, and again, unions should, should not be proud of this. Um, this is something that um, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's very sad to hear that um, in a, a special interest arrangement is getting in the way of, of success. Well, you know, and what's, what's particularly troubling, you know, and, and you've read the report, obviously, here in Rhode Island, and, you know, we're, we're a tiny little place, and, and so the news reporting has been fiercely focused on this. The, uh, the city of Providence, I believe, is a member of the American Federation of Teachers, and the local head of the local chapter of AFT expressed shock and disgust over the condition of the schools. And at first, you take that at face value, and you, you, know, and you, you understand how, you know, as a teaching professional in an associated support position, she would feel that way. Then the question becomes very quickly, once the shock and anger, you know, we're going through the stages of grief here in Providence, all right, and the love of God, how could she not know about these conditions if you're, in fact, head of a teacher's union? Sure. They should have been talking about this uh, if they hadn't for years prior. But talk about burying the lead. If the teacher's union um, uh, head says, oh, the, the schools are in terrible shape, isn't this awful? She's steering the, or whoever they are, they're steering the topic away from uh, the reports of the teachers and the educators saying the collective bargaining agreement is getting in the way of their success. So, you know, that that to me sounds like a bit of a bait and switch. Um, I think the union should absolutely be held responsible for these contracts. And, uh, you know, I think that the the condition of the schools is, um, you know, it's if it is also true that, that the report says, that the principals and the teachers that they talk to are very dedicated and, and say that they, um, you know, they feel like they're giving the very best they can, which, of course, there are, right? There are thousands right. upon thousands of dedicated teachers and school leaders around the country, Rhode Island and elsewhere. So if that's the case, uh, then you need to, we need to remove the barriers that are in their way. And, um, you know, boy, if the, if the bargaining agreement is, is one of them, I would head straight for that. I would start there. Because the other issue is that the report focused on extensively was the condition of the physical plant. Mm. And we're talking about graffiti, open flooding, asbestos, rats in an American school system. And it's not isolated circumstances. The problems, if you read the report, and again, I want to stress, the report is done by arm's length educational professionals at the behest of a new statewide a uh, newly hired uh, head of schools. Um, this, this is there's no agenda by these folks. There's, in, in fact, it became clear as how progressively they upset they got as they continued their exploration. I, and the physical plant. I don't know what to say about it except it, the fact that, you know, as long as these, you know, unions are are promised the world in terms of incredible retirement funds. No participation in healthcare in a, in a universe where, quite frankly, that train has left the station for most of us. I, I don't know how to otherwise cast the notion that we're paying for retirements in healthcare at the direct expense of the physical safety of the students. And the report makes that, without drawing that conclusion, it essentially draws it for you. And I, you know, I, I just in closing, I mean, have you, in all of your experience, because Goldwater and Heritage is looking at the nation at large, but at the same time, micro-focused on individual school districts. It's, you know, because of the absence of any political agenda your organizations have, they're able to engage in honest conversations that are not possible in the way that professional education is structured now. There's no consulting contracts at stake. There's no advocacy at stake. There's no political considerations at stake. Have you, and so this is an unfair question, but that's how I am. Have you seen situations this dire based on your initial reading of that report? 
Well, there are other districts that uh, struggle with similar problems and others. So, for example, Chicago has struggled for many years with uh, school fraud is, is an issue there, the misuse of money. Um, uh, I think St. Louis has also struggled as an, as an inner city area for many years. And so it, it is not uncommon in large uh, uh, urban school districts. So Los Angeles, um, you know, parts of New York City. Uh, Miami. I mean, there there are districts, right, that that struggle with these um, w- with very similar issues, and it's because of the way the system is set up. It's way, the way that it is built, and oftentimes, especially in in places like L.A., for example, and others, it uh, a no small part of it is the relationship with the teachers union and the way that the union um, has a stranglehold on the way that that employment negotiations happen between. Um, the teachers and the district. And so for, that's why there were strikes in L.A., for example, earlier uh, this year and, and talk of it late last year. Uh, there have been strikes in Oakland and elsewhere in California. Um, and, and much of this, you know, they'll say, well, you know, teachers aren't being paid enough. Well, I mean, some of this will come back to the district saying, hey, look, your arrangement with the union puts us in a situation where we're spending money that we don't have. I mean, we can agree to a pay raise, but where's the money going to come from? So, uh, you know, you have to be very realistic about uh, school finance. And and, uh, you mentioned pension and and retirement funds. I mean, these are not small things. I mean, you're you're talking about significant sums of money that that many of these these local systems don't have. And so they're going to to try to do the impossible. And um, and sadly, unless the arrangement with unions changes and you make it more parent focused and about the students, you're going to see more of these problems in the future. Well, Jonathan Butcher of the Goldwater Institute in Heritage, uh, again, you grace us with your presence. I can't tell you how grateful we are to Goldwater in general, as well as yourself, for giving of yourself so freely to, to us here in, in little Rhode Island and across the libertarian nation. Um, as we always like to say when we close out, please engage in a couple of minutes of shameless self-promotion. Is there something you're working on right now or about to release that you want to tell us about? And how can folks follow you? on the web. Uh, well, thank you. So I'm on Twitter at, at uh, JM underscore butcher. And uh, later this year, we will have a book out uh, from the Heritage Foundation, uh, myself and uh, my colleague, Lindsay Burke, who's the director of our Center on Education Policy. We have a number of excellent authors who are contributing to this volume. So more on that as it comes. We'll have more information uh, coming later this fall, but uh, we're looking forward to releasing that volume. Well, and we're looking forward hopefully to seeing you here on a book tour because please give us advance notice of that so that we can arrange a number of functions where uh, coffee and uh, highly tuned adult beverages might be a factor. All right. Uh, Jonathan, again, thank you so much for joining us and, and the continuing service I you provided. I know you've worked with a couple of organizations here in town. You've been in town before. You know, everything that you've said in the handful of years that we've been working with you folks – has come true and everything the all the advice that you continue to give is now proving to be priceless and we're going to do whatever we can working with a couple of the organizations in town to just highlight uh, the intelligence the message that emanates from goldwater and heritage and you know and hopefully maybe it had to get this bad for people to listen maybe Mm -hmm. And if there's ever any saving grace to how desperate the situation is, maybe mm. we finally reach that point of rock bottom. I can mm. only hope. Mm. Well, God bless you, lad. All right. Well, thank you. Great to be with you. All right. We'll talk again soon. Of course, that was Jonathan Butcher. He's a senior fellow at the Goldwater Institute, as well as Heritage, specializing in education reform. We're going to try and get this out as quickly as possible to folks. You know. I don't think anything else need be said. We are the Coalition, loud and proud, outrage, porn free, civilly disobedient media, broadcasting live on the worldwide Coalition Network here at the Go Local Live Broadcast Center, deep in the heart of tonight, a challenged city, Providence, Rhode Island. Facebook.com slash the Coalition Radio on the Mighty Mighty Twitter at Coalition underscore radio, and of course the mothership, Coalition Radio US. We're going to be about five minutes or so, but stay tuned. We'll be back with Connor DeGratis, and we'll be talking about some guy named Amash. I don't know. There was some sort of kerfuffle this weekend. Who knows, right? Stay tuned. We'll be right back.